I'm doing an image that is 1920 by 1080, so an HD image. It's just zoomed out a little bit so you can see the whole screen. And usually for most projects what I do is I create a custom palette so that I don't have to go digging through the palettes up here. And you can put about anything you want on here. So all of these are my brushes. These are a couple of gradients. These are some layer commands that I may use. And these are all some image hoses that I created that uh, I may use all of them. I may use some of them. And usually I just stick it at the bottom of the screen and we'll go to there when I need to use something instead of having all the boxes open. If I open all the boxes, then it gets really created or really cluttered really quick. And um, I have a hard time keeping track of things when they're not cluttered. So I try to keep uh, most of what I do uh, for each project on its own palette, own custom palette. To create one, you just go to Window and Custom Palette, and you can add a command or organize. You can um, create, save workspace. You can do all this. I don't, but I want to get to doing the picture instead of turning on all that stuff. So I'm going to be coming down here and just clicking on these things instead of going too deep into the brush controls or anything like that. So I'm going to paint an image uh, that's just kind of a, well, an enchanted forest kind of image. And I'm going to start working from the back and I'll just start building it. I'm going to apply a gradient first, something to work with. And so I will click on that and hopefully it gets to my right gradient. Sometimes I have to click a couple times through it. And I'm going to drag from the top to the bottom. That's the wrong gradient, so we'll try it again. Still the wrong gradient. Uh, live demos, you know. So I'll go pick it here. There's the correct gradient. So I was just kind of doing a sky kind of thing. New feature in this is expressing paint into my gradients. I like the heavy dabs and I like a lot and it'll be able to preview the effect hopefully here. You can see so it's kind of painting in the gradient. If I move it, it'll paint it. And I hope you can see that on your screen. Um, it just kind of does a nice randomizing of the gradient thing. And I commit it. So now I've got my background gradient and I'll start building on it. I'm going to use the pen tool and I'm going to start from the back and work forward. So building some hills. So, and there's no particular right or wrong way that I'm doing this. It's just whatever I want to do. And that shape, I'm going to convert it to a selection. I would think, unless I didn't close it. I got the wrong one. Now let's see if that works. Okay, live demo. We'll try it again. Okay, this will be my first background layer. And what I'm going to do is just fill it with a straight color and it's going to be something darker than something in the background here. I always have to make sure to create a new layer and I didn't want to fill it with the gradient. I wanted to fill it with current color. A little darker than that. That's perfect. And I'm going to create the next background layer. I'll get the backgrounds kind of laid in first, just so I know what I'm doing. And this will, again, I'll convert it to a selection. And then I will go with a color that is a little darker than my first one, and that was my air. I should create a new layer. 
and then I'll create the foreground layer. And I just do this mostly just because I can kind of get smooth, nice looking shapes. And I'll make sure this one's on under layer. Oh, I set, when you open Painter, this is usually displayed as RGB in the sliders down here. I always change it to hue, saturation, and value. That way, if I want a darker value of this color, I can just move the value slider down a little bit, and I'm not, not guessing. Sometimes guessing works really good. Sometimes guessing doesn't work really good. Where did my selection go? There we go. Wrong layer. That's interesting. So let me get rid of this. Like Life TV. Okay, let me make a new selection. Sometimes it's just easier to start over. A smart person would label their layers, but since I'm not so smart sometimes, I tend to just wing it, and then we'll get into the trouble that you see I'm having here. I never label my layers, Don. I don't, I don't either, unfortunately. Oh, I didn't close the selection. Huh? Now maybe it will fill. So I let everybody know, I forgot to mention, um, as you have questions, you can just log them into the questions panel. And if I can't answer it myself, then I'll throw it out to Don. OK. Um, OK, so now I've got my basic hills in. And I'm going to start adding some trees to them using an image hose. And so these are my two image hose brushes. And I've included them both. Um, one varies the size a little bit more, and this one's a little more straightforward. And I've got two nozzles here, Skinny Trees 2 and Skinny Trees Nozzle. When I create a nozzle, I always add the word to it. Otherwise, I forget what's a nozzle and what's not a nozzle. And it takes me just a second to decide what the size I want is. And that's a little big. So I watch, I try to watch my radius up at the top there. And sometimes it helps me, sometimes it doesn't. That'll be good for the first layer, maybe a little bigger. Okay, so I'm going to create a new layer down here. And that'll be my first layer of trees. This color, if I set it to the back, I can add additional that color to this. So these trees look a little too contrasty right now. So I'm going to add some of that background color to them. Now you can see they start looking more in the background. And if I move this all the way down to zero, then I just get a flat series of trees, which actually is not too bad for this step. So I think I'll leave the back series of trees right there. Then I'm going to switch to Tiny Leaves 2, I think, is the one I want to use. And I'm going to go ahead and do these trees on the same level. And that'll be fine. I don't need my background trees with a lot of a distinction in them because for the most part they're going to be hidden. 
as I do more foreground trees. Now this nozzle is, I created it myself just by using, painting little tree shapes and then making multiples of them so that I can paint lots and lots of leaves really quick. And I, I tap the brush a lot when I'm using image hoses. So I can just get a little bit of leaves here, a little bit of leaves there. My next level of trees will be the same thing, but I'm going to use less additional color. And it's still going to be behind the, it's going to be behind this first layer. So it'll go behind this one and in front of this one. And so I'll go back to my trees. Not big enough. Not big enough. I'm doing a control Z, command Z to get rid of what I don't want to see. And actually these trees are just going to follow um, the hill here. So get them a little darker. I wish I could tell you there's a formula for adding the background color in, but I just have to do it and figure it out myself. That's not too bad, so I'm going to do a few, tap a few, and leave, leave a couple of gaps here and there so that I can see the trees behind. I'll switch back to the nozzle I was using before, the same amount of additional color. Maybe a little more, because that's, I'll make it a little darker. And as I get start working my way forward, I try to do a little bit of variety in what I'm painting. So I'm going to select the color from the tree itself and paint a little bit in. And I'll go value just a little bit lighter for kind of the top leaves that would be facing the light. Again, I keep these pretty simple as I'm working my way forward. And I'm going to work on the ground in a little bit. I want to get the trees in first, and then I'll work on the ground. So now I'm going to put some trees on this layer, get the background dark, and we'll see what happens. I'll go back to the same nozzle. And that's supposed to be not on that layer, so. Let me change. I'm getting some little trees, and I don't want two little ones right now. I guess I'm going to have little ones regardless of what I do, so we'll have little trees and then I'll cover them up. And then back to the leaves again. It's pretty boring just doing leaves, but uh, I'll get the dark color from the trees. It's much easier to zoom in or a lot of times if I'm doing real simple I can just tab out and do a full screen. But I'll have to tab back in. That's too, too green for me. So I'll put additional color down. I've got a lot of questions coming in about your the brushes you're using here, Don. Okay. So I don't know if you want to hold or you want me to throw them out now. Well, I'm putting in some leaves. Can you ask them, or do I need to stop and read them? Or? Oh, no, no. I can ask you. So um, people are wondering, you know, what kind of brush is this? 
And I know you have created a tutorial for us on how to create an image hose brush. Right. Um, so they're wondering how to create it. So I'll be sure to let everybody know where to find that. Um, okay. But you know, some of the questions are, will this work in earlier versions of Painter? And the brush set that you're going to be giving people, is that specific to Painter 2017 only? I know that these brushes, the nozzles won't matter, the image files won't, these won't matter, and I don't think the nozzle hose brush has changed a lot since earlier versions, so I don't think there's going to be any trouble uh, using it. I can show you, whoops, a little too big, really quickly. Um, as I get toward the end, I'll go fast so I can show you how to create an image hose. I like the best. Painter comes with a number of standard nozzles you can see up here. I tend to like to paint and make my own uh, to fit whatever I'm doing. So I made all these called leaves and stuff, and this is you're going to get this whole file so that you can play with it. You will also get these two brushes that I'm using because they're doing what I want. They're not rotating uh, the image a lot. Uh, the brushes can be set to rotate the image, do all sorts of things with it, pick up secondary colors, uh, do lots and lots of things with it. And I'm not that worried about it. I'm just... Um, I want it to do what I want it to do, which is make me some good-looking trees. So let me go now and tab out so you can see. So now, hopefully, I'm on the right layer, which I'm going behind this front tree. See how big they come out? Not big enough. As I get forward, I don't use, um, I don't want to put in as many trees because I don't want the background to get completely lost in the foreground. Cut a couple little extra ones here um, that I really don't want. So I will go ahead and get rid of at least this one because it'll be an easy get rid of. Just select it and backspace it. This one's a little tougher, so I'll probably just pretend it's not there a lot and hope that you don't notice uh, the errors. So then I'll put some leaves on these ones. Whoops, that's not right. Make sure I get the brush. I'm always doing that. I hold, dra hold down the control and the Alt key to resize it and I move the layer instead of having, or duplicate the layer. So I want to do that. So I want to go back to my brush, which is also the B key. And I'll pick the background color. And let's see what happens. OK, so I can get my leaves progressively bigger as I come forward. which is what I want. What I do want is this kind of depth of field thing going, uh, this atmospheric perspective uh, thing going. So I try to keep the lightest things in back with the least amount of detail. That's why if I go back and hide all these layers, you know, that very, very back layer almost starts to become irrelevant as far as the image goes. But I know it's there, and I know that trees go back in the forest and all that stuff. So it becomes important for me to uh, try to build it at least marginally correctly as I'm painting along. So add a few more light leaves. It doesn't take a lot of value change. To get this John, we're getting some questions about, um, so with the image hose, and I can tell that you created a couple different varieties of these trees to include in the hose, but you can tell me whether or not that's correct. 
Oh, that's, you know, that's a good question, and I can show you the file when I get done, because the file is actually, I painted two, maybe three trees, and then I duplicated them, and scaled them, and flipped them, and uh, did a number of things to them, so that when I do get back to, you know, the very back trees, it looks like you, you can see some duplication especially right here. Uh, I've got the image hose set, so it should put them out randomly, so sometimes it'll stick a few together. But I try to build and reuse assets as much as possible, um, which is frankly one of the reasons to paint digitally, is that I can use these image hoses in all sorts of uh, different things if I want to. Um, so it's, um, it's not a bad thing to use, you know, build one or two and then use them as much as you can. I'm going to create a new, let's see, what's on, nothing's on that layer, because I just want to start putting a few little leaves and things in front. What kind of tablet are you using? This is a, a very old um, Wacom Intuos 4. It, it's one of the first ones that came out. I personally like the tablets almost better than the Cintiqs. Um, I have to admit I bought an off-brand Chinese one just recently to try and see how it compared. and. It was $159 compared to over $500 for Wacom's tablet, and I really like it. It's, it's a very good tablet. Um, I don't have any complaints at all with it. I've got two computers that I use at home so I can move around between rooms, and it's, it's a very, very nice one. Um, so if you're looking for in fact, I think their 6x8 tablets are only $69. I mean, they're very inexpensive. Um, the only problem or the only difference I really see is their pens have um, batteries, take a single AAA battery to uh, run. And whether that bothers you or not is really kind of up to you. Uh, I'm going to put some junk in the background here. But if you're looking for a tablet, there are some alternatives out there now. So I created these little weedy image hoses, too. Um, John is wondering if you would consider this style of painting cell shading. Um, not really, because I'm not using, um, I'm not defining anything by any sort of crisp edge or anything like that. Uh, it is it is a relatively flat uh, technique, which is not the same as a lot of my other illustration work, but I don't know that it's really cell shading so much. I guess you could use it as such. Okay, change. I've got some other nozzles that go backwards. And this this will look kind of like a random pile of stuff, but that's okay because it's going back in the distance. My next trees, they kind of mix in well with it, so I'll make a little bit darker. I don't want to use that one. And these are really, these image hoses are really easy to make. I'm going to make this next visible so I just know that I'm not just wasting time painting behind something. Let's show my next trees, this layer. And now I start trying to figure out where I want the layers to be.
Don, do you know the name of that Chinese tablet you had mentioned? Um, it's downstairs. I could look it up on, on Google. Just, okay. Well, I can do a quick it starts search. With an H. It starts with an H. I don't remember other than that, though, what it okay. is. Sorry. All right. Let me, I'll do a quick search. No problem. Oh, Huion tablet? Yeah. That's what everybody is saying. <laughs> Thanks that for would helping. Be them. Don, Thank Emily, you, everybody. and Nick. <laughs> I try to work with colors that generally are what I'm working with anyway, so that I don't lose any consistency. Then when I get to the front here, and I'll go a lot darker. That's a little too dark, probably. I'm sorry if you hear some snoring in the background. It's my bulldog. He's kind of squeaks when he when he breathes. So, but he insists on being at my feet. I know how that is because mine is sitting right at my feet right now. Yours too. Mm -hmm. This is, right now he's squeaking. He usually snores like a chainsaw, but uh, he's just kind of squeaking in the background right now. Okay, Can and so in the front, go ahead. Sorry. Can you recap again why you choose to use the um, HSC? I would, I'm always just, I do a lot of stuff for Wacom, and I like them. And they're great guys and uh, good friends. But um, in my teaching career, students are not always um, set to spend as much money as they like to charge. And so I'm always kind of on the lookout for something that might be a little less expensive. And even for myself, because when I travel and talk or do something, would I rather carry a $300 6 by 8 tablet or a $69 uh, tablet that works just as well that I'm not really afraid of breaking? And so that's, that's the general reason for it. I'm going to adjust this so it's a little bit darker. And I, I've seen no problem with the quality. It's been very good quality. Other than the pen, you know, is a little heavier. But the pen to me doesn't make much difference anyway because I learned on, it was back in, back in the day, a CalComp tablet, and it took hearing aid batteries. And so it was really, um, you know, it was really a challenge to paint with it because you felt like you were being weighed down. Okay, so these are some thorns. I, you know, you've always got to have a few thorns in. Can't be all just nice, nice grass and weeds, right? So. I know that you there, tend I, to go um, darker with your style. Stephanie is wondering if you ever paint a forest using fantasy colors such as pinks, purples, reds. These aren't these aren't fantasy colors. I was thinking Snow White here. Um, you know, it's it's funny. Years ago, I was doing an image, and I I'll have to show it to you. While standing at a booth for Corel, and it was about Painter Nine, and I don't remember who was standing there with me, but somebody was watching me, and I was painting a monster because people liked monsters, and he looked at me and he said, don't you ever do anything cute? And I said, sure, I, I do cute all the time. And he said, I bet you can't do anything cute. And so I painted a little pink bunny in the corner getting his stuffing ripped out. Okay, now I'm just putting in some foreground trees. 
I remember that painting, Don. Remember that? Yes. Sir. Okay, I'm not going to put in too many than this. Now, I've got a lot of duplication here, just because I've only really got, I think, six trees in this nozzle. So I'm going to flip a couple of them and uh, distort them a little bit just to give me a little variety. So Control X, Control V, and uh, Edit, Flip Horizontal, and let's see. We'll do a Control T again. I set, I use both. You know, I'm sorry, Tanya. I use Photoshop and Painter, and I set the keyboards all so they're the same in one program, so I don't have to um, change things a lot. So. Whoops, let me go to the other one. Because I'm lazy and I, and I can't, my brain, you know, I'm starting to get old and my brain power will not remember multiple keyboards. Um, although I did just recently, and I've yet to try it, buy a Cherry keyboard and its keys are all programmable. So I'm going to start programming them into the shortcuts I want. There's quite a few people asking about um, what size and resolution you're working at. And what do you recommend? This is, and I thought I cut that out. This is 19, uh, 1920 by 1080. So this is HD. Um, and I'm doing that mostly because it's pretty, it's pretty manageable size to finish something up before um, before I no longer have time. So it doesn't it used to be um, sorry, it used to be that you know if you did anything that was sixteen hundred by twelve hundred that was big. And now most of the time my images will be three to five thousand pixels on um, the larger short side because I can get away with it. I used to not be able to get away with that big an image. I don't work more than uh, so here's there's 100 percent 150 200. It, it used to be if you worked more than 200 percent you hit diminishing returns because you would start putting in details that a printer wouldn't see. Now, with the high-res displays and retina displays and all, you, know, you can work larger than 200%, but I don't really recommend it because you do at some point, if you're working at 400%, you start hitting a point where you're doing um, details that nobody's going to see. So I made that tree floating. I'm just stretching out the bottom part of its trunk. Make it a little wider. I guess I just cut it poorly. Uh, I always uh, deep I get a lot of questions about DPI and what DPI should be. And if you're going to print it, of course your DPI should be at least 200. 300 is fine, but I've noticed that 200 I do not lose uh, any any resolution, I can get away with 200 dpi just fine and go really quite big. And it used to be you were asked to convert things to CMYK, but that's no longer the case. I would always recommend um, recommend that you work with. Um, okay, senior moment here that you recommend with RGB images, the main reason being that everybody will take them now, and the second most important reason being that um, they're one quarter the size of uh, CMY images because you only have three channels instead of four, which is nice. Looks like it. I still have some people asking, and I know you mentioned this towards the beginning, but the fact that you use the hue, saturation, and value, um, can you just recap again why you choose to switch to that mode as opposed to the 
to follow. Oh, okay, sure. I can do that and, and show, I think, it pretty dramatically. Um, Thank you. If I've got, say I want to paint something really bright, uh, bright red, okay, so we'll, we'll just start here. Now, this is the value of the color, of course, and this is the saturation of the color, and then the color wheel is the hue. And if you're just moving around picking, like getting darker and darker here, all of a sudden your darkest red, that's nice. Let's make sure we switch our colors back. So now that's my red. And if I go down to the darkest red I can get just with that, that would be it. But if I use the sliders and I start with a really bright red, then I can move the value down, and without changing the hue or saturation, it starts to get darker and darker because it's not a straight down curve. I mean a straight down line. It will take you darker. And then if you want to go lighter, it'll go up to, you know, instead of just going straight here, it actually kind of forms a curve. And that way I can keep the hue um, consistent with the values. And red's a strange color because it really is the only color when you get up into here, you're talking a different color. Uh, gray's, gray and black are the same way. So this no longer becomes a red unless you're using it to paint. It becomes a pink. Too much pink will make it, everything look pink. So that's why I use these sliders, so I can leave the hue the same intensity instead of changing it. I'm sorry, the hue the same instead of changing it. And then the saturation, if I go down, it just gets more dull. So that's why I use it instead of the RGB sliders. Having said that, I've got a student that uh, was colorblind. And so his traditional work was atrocious, but his color work was fine because he could add in the values here to get whatever color he thought. So, you know, whatever might look brown to him might look, well, I know because I yelled at him one day because he was supposed to be doing something that was olive green, this color, and his color was turquoise. And... Uh, it was like, why aren't you listening to me? I want you to, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, you're colorblind. I get it. Okay, so he was much more successful if he's a little bit colorblind when he was a lot, working with the RGB sliders and entering entering the values of the colors, because he would eventually learn what they were anyway, uh, or what they would look like to him. Okay, I'm gonna add a few leaves up in the front here. If I can figure out which one I wanted to use. That's trees. They don't look so good up there. A little bigger. These are just not like that. I'm just tapping so I don't get too much going on. And I think those need to little bit, be a little bit darker, so I'm going to do that. And I'll add some little bit lighter ones just on top of it. Okay, so for the most part, what I've got here is would be considered kind of finished, but there's nothing on these forward trees. They look really boring, and so um, you can use one of my favorite brushes is this Real 2D pencil, and I can use um, Fine Spray here, uh, which is an airbrush. I'm going to create a layer above them. I'm going to load the selection, so I'm holding my Control key and tapping in the thumbnail. If you tap in here, it won't do what you want it to do. You need to tap in the thumbnail. And then with this layer, 
I'll change it to multiply. And I can come in and start to I just raise the opacity to 80%. You can start to add That's a little strong, but you can add shadows and you don't have to worry about. Now you, I could do it on the same layer, but the reason I don't, I'm going to show you here in just a second. And there are so many default brushes you could do. You could do this with almost any brush. I personally like to paint with as few brushes as possible. Um, years ago, I was teaching a digital painting class, and my best students, illustration students, would uh, almost always tank when they were painting digitally because they thought since they had 16 million colors, they would use every darn one of them, and there were just a lot of problems. And then one day, I had a student, so now my trees have a little bit of life to them. I probably could add a little more. But I had a student that was deaf, and he was Korean, and English was his second language. And he was having a miserable time. Um, he just couldn't. I, I was sure he was going to fail because he had people that would sign for him and um, I would spend hours trying to help keep him up, catch him up, because uh, he just didn't understand. He couldn't watch me demo and uh, get the sign language at the same time. So I got some, a little bit of body to these trees. But what I found out was uh, everybody turns in their first assignment, and his is the best one. And in my mind, I'm saying, uh-oh, you know, okay, I've missed something here. And what I'm doing here is I'm creating a shadow of the leaves. Um, so I asked him what he'd done, and he said he didn't know what he did, so he took the first brush that he could find, and he simply painted a painting with it. And it changed the whole way I looked at teaching digital painting uh, because he didn't need every layer, every uh, trick, everything to get him started. He just needed to pick the first layer or the first brush and start painting. Okay, so now I've got like a shadow bunch of leaves on the trees. I'm going to soften these. so they don't look so harsh. It's John, I know you have this tip in one of your the recent videos you created for me, but how do you quickly select the, um, like you just did with the foreground trees? Is it just control click? Control, command, and then you click the thumbnail. You don't click the layer itself, you click the thumbnail. Okay. Okay, if you click the layer, if you click the layer, it'll, you know, add it or if you double click it, it'll let you rename it and do all sorts of things with it. So click the thumbnail. Okay, so now I've got the shadows. They're a little heavy for me. I want them to look kind of like um, the shadows I've got down here. Oh, those are the lights. So shadows I've got there. Maybe I need to darken these, so I'll duplicate this layer. And when I like that, if I do or not, I'll combine these two layers. I mean, I'm sorry, collapse them. It changes them back to a default layer, so I'll just set them to multiply again. Now, I obviously don't want the shadows of the leaves hanging in the air. So what I do now is with the trees selected, I'll invert the selection. And I'll click that shadow layer, and I'll backspace it. 
now all of a sudden I've just got shadows on my trees from the leaves instead of shadows where I don't want them to be. I will also, um, I can combine all these now I think in the foreground. And you should save. I'm not saving a lot, so if I crash this, I'm going to lose everything. So I'm going to save real quick. Do you ever paint with the new texture brushes? Um, yes, I do, but I'm I'm kind of a little bit clunky with them still. So, and I'm going to give you a compliment because um, Leland said that he's learned more from you than any other painter artist. Oh, I wanted thank you. To hear that. that that's actually really nice. <laughs> you know, okay, I'm going to. This one's not. I want to get these leaves a little darker too. So I'll duplicate this layer, change it to um, the multiply. It's too dark for me, so I'll lighten it a, a touch. And then I'll grab the eraser, which I thought I had out, but I guess I don't. I've got a zillion brushes, guys, you know, way more than anybody with any sense should have. So um, don't pay attention to my bad habits. and just lighten them a little bit. I don't like this on here either, but there's nothing I can do about it now since I collapsed them. Once I get a change that I like, what I usually do is do a Control-Alt-S, which right now you can see the name of the image. Control-Alt-S is Iterative Save, and it will add a number to it. And I'm kind of fanatical about saving, and so I will end up with 80 or 90 saved images, and then if I want, I can put them into a, kind of a quick movie. So um, just decide, depends on what you want to do. Duplicate the layer. I actually got that on the button here. I don't know why I have to go up there. And I actually think I want my trees behind, so let me collapse these two. I'm sorry. That looks a little better with them with them behind. I'm going to create some um, God rays real quick coming behind the the tree. These leaves they always kind of make a nice little kind of sparkly thing going on, and if you're doing a forest, so I'll come up and get the polygonal selection tool. And I just start doing in these kind of triangular shapes. And this last one, you probably won't see anything of it. So, And I'm going to feather this a little bit. So um, let's see. Three is maybe not big enough. I think I'll go seven. You can see they start to soften a little bit down here. Now on their own layer, what I'll do is I'll pick get my brush. So I got a brush. And I'll pick one of these back layers and a digital airbrush, big. And what is it doing to me? Okay, not working, so I'll try a different brush. There. And they're going to have to go behind the trees, but this is okay. Then I will get a variable splatter brush because there will be little dust motes in these. Little 
dust motes floating around. So deselect it. Let me move it behind the trees themselves. And I painted them light enough. I can probably just either lower the opacity until you can kind of see it. Usually what I'll do, though, is change it to a screen method and then tweak the opacity a little bit until I get something that looks reasonable. Now, they still look harsh to me, so I'll go ahead and soften them. Maybe, you know, that looks a little better. That maybe even looks a little better. Okay, now I've lost all my really cool little dust mode floating around in them. So all I'll do is go down into the layers and control click on it. And so it it's masked. Anything that's 50% or less um, transparent, it, it draws the line there. So it's still masked. I don't know what I just did. But it's still masked anything going down, but it just draws its line at 50%. Then I can add back in some of the dust motes. Maybe. Oh yeah, it's a little, it's a little, get rid of them. I should do this on a new layer, so. So now I've got a few little dust motes in there, and those are probably a little too opaque. Make sure I got the right layer. And that's starting to get to be about to where I want it to be. The last thing I'm going to do in this one is um, in the images here, I drew this bear, and so I'm going to tap on him. And I got a lion too, but the bear's the one I wanted to use. And so now I put my bear in my forest. Now he's a little bright for what's going on and a little big, but uh, I kind of wanted him to be able to look like he was hanging on to a branch. So maybe he is, maybe he isn't. And you can save your own. Um, I guess I could put in a line. I just don't have a tiger. We'll put him farther back. Like back behind. I've got to make them look, they're too bright right now. So what I'll do, and you can see the bottom of him, so what I need to do is take the eraser, whoops, not the glow, I forgot to drag the eraser out. Okay, so when you get the eraser, it's up here. Hold the shift key, and you can drag it down onto a new palette. Okay, so I'm hiding him a little bit. Then I'll click on him to load a selection, a new layer above him, and I'm going to fill it with, you know, one of these darker greens. And then lower the opacity. So he starts to go back in the atmosphere like you would expect him to. Sometimes I like soft light, and so I just have to try different things, but it's not going to work in this case, so I'll just go with default. And I like to do this too, maybe even a little more than needs to be done, because I like a lot of times for people to look at something and go, oh. Wow, I didn't see that to begin with. Let me group these. Control-G, Command-G will group them. 
And then if I don't like him in that position, you know, I can move him around somewhere else. And my bear, the same thing happens. He's a little bit too, he's a little bit too um, strongly colored, I guess. The alt key is the color picker. I try to go to the menus a lot when I'm demoing because it's easier to follow. Now with him, I might be able to go colorize. So I can just cool him down enough that he looks like he's part of the forest and not standing out like a sore thumb there. Too much contrast. And then deselect control, control D. And I'll collapse these two layers. And I can now move him around if I want to. Let's do it this way. Oh, now he's going the other way. And that's about the extent of it. Let me tab out and zoom in. So there's 100%. These monitors are not 4K, but they're higher resolution. So Very cool, Don. The whole point really is to make some of the resources pretty quick and reuse them as much as you can, as many times as you can. And this is, in an hour, it's a little quicker than I would probably normally spend. But unless you get somebody really, really picky, they're probably not going to pick on me too bad about you know, the size of the leaves here or here or some tangent, the tree is growing out of his head, or, or something like that. Um, do you want me to show you an image hose really quick? Was that a you good know, thing? I, don't, I do not expect you to do that right now. I know okay. that we have tutorial videos, so this is what I'm going to do. I will okay. include a link to um, any of the videos where you've covered that. Okay. People can take a look if they still have questions. Um, you all have my email feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best to answer your questions. And the other thing that um, we have had a lot of questions just about your books and um, I don't know if you'll be writing another new book anytime soon, but there's a lot of interest in it. Just to I let am, you know. Now that I am, uh, what, how should I say, semi-retired, um, yeah, I'm seriously thinking about doing <coughs> Uh, digital painting book and um, really my books tend to be more art related and this is how you would use a program to do that instead of this is how you use a program to do something special and so what I what I've done today would be probably applicable back oh the one thing I was going to do that I didn't do um, they would be applicable back quite a ways unless you want to use um, let's turn, swirling. It's one of the uh, particle brushes. And so I wanted to let me figure out what I want to go behind. That'll be good. So I wanted to put in this kind of swirling effect. And these particle brushes are great and, and crazy and gray in that case, which is not what I wanted. See, I can add kind of a smoky or foggy effect, and then I will soften it. And I usually don't want to soften it so I obliterate it, but sometimes that's okay. And if I wanted to do it in the very front to show you the brush, then I would do, I don't know what that, oh, that's, okay. 
I'll add a layer here. These brushes are really fun, especially if you just kind of want to add some randomness. And when I was talking about DPI, your computer screen for the most part does not care about DPI. It is it is strictly a print prints uh, print concern, and so uh, I usually go by pixel size when, when I'm painting, and then if I need to, I'll convert it over to at least 200 uh, DPI when I'm going to get it printed. I'm going to screen that. And then you can mess around with it. If you've got 2015 through or 2017, I, do the brushes work in both? I know they some do, but I don't know if they all do. But um, I, yeah, I love the, um, to... I'm sorry, yeah. you're asking about the particle brushes? Yeah, I was just, I love to use them kind of at the end to add you know, kind of some special, you know, kind of effects. If you're sure. going to campfire, they're great. Um, but I didn't remember how many versions back they did. Well, we um, came, the particles came in 2016. Okay. So. I couldn't remember. I, oh, I'm talking about the DPI. One last thing, too. Um, a few versions ago, I had this picture, this angry princess on Corel's cover and even when I print it full size at 20 by 20 inches you couldn't see the freckles on her nose unless you were looking at a screen version because I'd gone in and I'd worked too much and I had freckles on her nose so she looked younger and then when I print it you don't see them anyway so there, there I'd hit the point of diminishing returns I did all this work and nobody could see it anyway so uh, you know, try not to zoom in too close, and um, you know, if you've got a retina display or something, that's great because you're almost at the 300 DPI. If you can't see it at 100% on a retina screen, don't paint it because you're not going to see it printed. Um, uh, DPI is the, the printing thing. So, so that's that's a bear and a lion, and I don't have a tiger. Sorry, you know, I should have had a tiger. <laughs> But, uh, Maybe next time. Next time, yes. Lions and tigers and bears. I uh, I could show you. I keep having. It's called feature creep. You know, terrible things to do. But I've got this pattern that I created, and I think it'll work. It's thorns, and so I have to use a pattern brush. And I'll put some. I'll put it on top so I don't ruin this layer. Uh, let's see. Pattern pen. There's some of my fa favorite uh, pens, but I'm. I don't think I have this one with transparency, so we'll have to see which one will work. Whoops. No. I need to make it with transparency, but then I can draw thorns in all size, but I forgot to put it on a transparent layer. So now I just make thorns the old-fashioned way, paint them. So anyway, thank you.